I'm Linda Kemp, and I'd like to show you an alternative approach to painting. Whether you're an accomplished artist or just starting out, I'm sure you'll find negative painting intriguing. It's a fun way to create beautiful watercolors. First, let's begin by looking at the difference between working in the negative and the more usual positive way. In this illustration, you can see on the left-hand side the typical or usual additive approach or working in the positive. On the right-hand side, you'll see the negative approach. The negative space is shown in the black. Positive and negative share the same edge. One can't exist without the other. It's a simple shift in the way that you visualize. If you're like most watercolor painters, you begin your landscapes with a sketch and then fill in your shapes with color and texture. It's typical to start at the top and progress down the painting to the bottom. Painting landscape in the negative, however, requires quite a different strategy. You'll be working in reverse. Start at the bottom and work to the top, and instead of filling in your shapes, you'll be painting around them. First, let's look at a couple of symbols that might represent a tree. On the left, we're not very convinced that this would be a tree. All of the branches would be the same size and come out from the trunk at the same angle. On the right-hand side, we see a symbol that more accurately represents a tree. We have a trunk and branches that break off at different angles and in different positions. It's really important that we create a symbol that conveys the idea of a tree to our viewer. In this sample, you'll see the same image or the same symbol repeated a number of times. I've flipped it and I've shifted it back. It's changing in value from light to middle to dark. Some of the shapes are smaller and they shift in position and change direction. I've prepared a little underpainting using a wet and wet technique and it's already dry so we're off to a good start. The colors that I've used are raw umber, Cerulean Blue, Raw Sienna, and I've also added just a touch of Thalo Blue. I'll be using that later on. I'm going to start carving out some of my trees using the same colors that I have in my underpainting. I'm working upside down, starting at the base of the tree and glazing around it. And I'm going to branch off here, wash the color away. Very delicate glaze of color. There we go, there's the first little break for a major limb from the trunk and back to the trunk, pull the color up. Let's work on the other side of the tree. Another limb and down the right side of the tree, washing the color away as I go. There's lots of time later to cut into the branches. I just want to get the major limbs in at this point. We're building in layers. The trees that are closest to us will be carved out first. Let's pull a branch off that one. It's really straight side on that one. A little bit of color. Now, I want to make sure that this trunk is either thicker or thinner than the first one. Let's make a nice thin one. There we go. Angling off with the trunk or with off from the trunk with a branch. At a slightly different angle and in a different location. A little lower down the tree. The tree's going to taper as it moves up to the top. Oh, got some paint and things here. cerulean blue down. All right, there we go. Let's put one more little skinny tree on this side. I began this row of trees a little ways up on the painting rather than starting at the bottom because I want to show the trees going off into the distance. Okay, there's my first layer. Now I'd like to show you how I'll progress up the page working into the back to develop the layers of trees as we move into the forest. To suggest distance or a deep interior, the layers progress upward in tiers from the bottom to the top. Consider that the picture plane is a shallow stage. Each layer is a flat screen laying one behind the other. You can see that the layers of the trees move further into the distance and they rise up and back, much like climbing a set of stairs. So the next layer will begin by stepping up the page so it appears to be back in the distance. 
I'll use the same colors again and start my next layer of trees. This is going to be a little darker as we move into the distance and I'll paint out, carving out the next tree. You want to make sure you include a lot of different widths of your trees and you also want to focus on having different spacing. At this point these are all the same so I'll have to keep that in mind when I'm working. This limb goes behind this tree and it'll pull up here. All right, you can continue to work and build up as many layers getting as intricate as you like, but I think you've got the idea and I'd like to move on to a landscape painting now. To paint a landscape in the negative, I'll be building overlapping bands of color that will be laid down from the bottom of the paper to the top. That is to say, I'll start in the foreground and work back. The landscape forms that are closest are painted first. Two layers of grasses and green trees appear, not because I've painted them, but rather because I've painted around them. Now we're going to free ourselves up. So I've got my apron on, all ready to get started. I'm going to prepare this underpainting. It starts out the same way as my wet and wet underpainting, but this time I'll be doing something a little bit different. I call it a dry on wet. There we go. Thoroughly wet. I'll be producing strips of color first that will represent grasses in the foreground. Now while this is resting, I'll put out my colors. Let's start out with a little bit of raw umber, some raw sienna, a little bit of cobalt blue, cerulean blue, a touch of rose violet. I'm putting out several colors here and well, let's go with a little bit of cad orange. Now the brush that I'm going to be working with is quite unusual for a watercolor brush. Uh, you may not be familiar with this type. It looks more like an oil painter's brush. Very stiff hair and I won't be adding a lot of water to it. In fact in the beginning stages I won't add any at all. So when I talk about dry on wet, paint isn't really dry but it's very very heavy. No extra water added. And I'm going to work this paint into the fibers of the brush. Pick up a little bit of some cerulean, a little bit of cobalt. So I'm not over stirring here and you can see it's very heavy paint. And I'm going to be applying the brush strokes in a, in a downward movement to start to get some grass texture. If I have too much water in the brush or on the paper, I won't be able to maintain nice grass-like texture. Now if I want to change colors, rather than rinsing my brush out and dunking it in the water, I just work it onto my apron so you'll see me do that several times. Now I have the first band of grasses in but I want to beat down the color to create an edge. So this is how we do it. I take the color and I pound it onto the paper so it's actually flicking the water that's on the surface of the paper and creating a nice little edge. What I'm doing is cutting out the edge of the first row of grass. So I'm not painting the grass, I'm painting around it or cutting out a descriptive edge. I want to make sure that I change the direction of the brush so that it moves in different ways. color that I'm putting down now I'll be able to use to develop some trees and bushes in the background.
All right, I'm going to put this underpainting aside and let it dry, and then when it is, I'll start carrying on with building the layers and making the shapes.